we're here to celebrate this thing called maybe life, but also listening. And in order to do so, we have a special guest with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Suzanne Rogers. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it, it is working. <laughs> so is that the first thing you do still, mic check? Yeah, and uh, Lisa Coleman, I just saw her when the Princess Band, the Revolution, did some shows at First Avenue, and so the road, the crew is on stage, and they're going, check, one, two, one, two, two, one, two, two. And she said to me, can audio text count beyond two? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I don't know if that's ever been tested. <laughs> May I, before we begin our conversation, can I please say uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really impressed. I saw this facility this morning and I learned more about you. And uh, I'm really, I've got to say congratulations to you participants who are here doing this, that you beat out so much competition indicates that you're already made of um, some rare stuff, and that's only a beginning. It's only a starting point. It's not a predictor of anything, really, but at least you're going to need that, so it's good that you have it. Uh, so good on you, as they say, for, for being here. And yeah, thank you all. Thank you. And just for perspective, if you felt bad the other day <clears throat> when you did not match Stevie's um, output by the age of 25, this is coming from someone who teaches at a little music school called Berkeley. So um, I think you know a little bit about music schools. A little bit. We see students from all over the world with uh, strengths and weaknesses, and uh, there's some overlap, and then there are always a few unique individuals, but... Yeah, we see the future of music, the young people of today who are at that, who are in the same place you are sort of in your career journey where you're both trying to figure out how to, how to make music, how to make this product. And I say product very consciously because I, I presume that you're making music in order to sell it, which means you're making music to... To, ha to make a career out of it. Uh, you don't have to. You can make music as a hobbyist. You can do that your whole life and probably be quite re well rewarded, internally rewarded by that. But if you want to be externally rewarded, if you want your music to be heard, if you want people to have opinions about it, if you want people to come up to your shows and buy your T-shirts and uh, visit your website, then that's a different conversation, a different conversation between you and your art. Um, and it's difficult. It's difficult. There are many variables. Before we get into these variables, I want to dial it back a little bit and talk about listening, because I guess that's where a lot of music starts. Um, when you know that a piece of music is dear to another human being, do you prefer to know before you listen yourself what it is in that particular piece that is dear to them, or would you like to go into it unbiased? What would be, um, let me ask, it depends on, on why you're listening to it. Uh, if you're listening to it to offer them a critique, the, if it's the artist, him or herself, then that would be different. But uh, do you mean we've just you're just with friends sharing music? I guess this is a couch, and we're trying to always make this as friendly as possible. So, um, yeah, let's assume it's a friendly situation. And ideally, that is sort of the vibe that you have in a studio as well as a professional. Oh, um, yeah. One of the, my favorite things to do in the studio was to have a record pull, a record pull where you, you just stop for a minute, and everyone takes turns playing music for one another. And the best thing is when they tell you why this is great. It's so good because it allows you to hear music through someone else's ears. So somebody will say, oh, this means so much to me because it solved this problem when I was 13 years old, or because this lyric just blows my mind, or because do you realize that the writer of this piece of music wrote this when he was about to lose his mind, or because uh, blah, 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 blah. This person was trying to imitate that one and actually failed, and uh, this is the result of a, actually a failure. And that's so exciting because it allows you to hear it 
filtering what you're hearing through a new set of knowledge that you didn't have before. Do you do that beforehand or after? Before. Now, it, but in, in a different context, if you're working with an artist in the studio, and it's probably worth mentioning if you're talking about record making, some producers like to ask the artist, what is this song about? So the producer can help the artist express what the song is about. Other producers, and I was one of them, preferred to not know what it was about, because I want to listen like the audience would listen, meaning I don't know you, I don't know what this is about. This song needs to mean something to me. So I don't care what it means to you. So what does For the Love of You by the Isley Brothers mean to you? And why should we care? Oh, so good. Do you know that song, For the Love of You by the Isley Brothers? Prince used to talk about the street you live on. And by that he meant the music that is your home base, the music that feels the most right to you. It's like the call of your people. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's, it's a voice that when you hear it, you just know, these are my people. <laughs> This just feels right. When I hear Alan Jackson Jr., the late great drummer, For Al Green, you hear you hear love and happiness, and you hear at the beginning of that song, dun 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 dun, da, 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 da. you already do the pigeon head, it's like, oh, I, yeah, it, it 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 it's my resonant frequency in that it's so powerful, I stop in my tracks for fear I'll break. I have to physically stop. When I hear that, it's so good. It's just so perfect. What that is and why, physiologically, what's happening, who knows. But to answer your question about for the love of you, it just makes me feel good. It just feels so good. That lead line and that voice, oh, just kills me. And where that comes from, I believe, is innate. I think Prince was onto something when he said home base. That's the street where you live. Now, that said... Uh, he believed, it seems to be true, that we can visit other neighborhoods and we can love other musics that's not our home base, um, whether it's salsa or jazz or it's uh, uh, folk rock or just whatever. You can visit other streets, but there's something you're always going to love best about your home base. So at this stage, I would kindly ask directors up there to lower the lights and make it very comfy in here. Can we do that? Can we lower them a little bit more? Just a little bit. We just want you guys to listen. And here is For the Love of You, parts one and two. What a treat that was. Oh my goodness, thank you for playing that. Oh, thank you. So why should people... Oops. We get to that in a second. Um, so at one of those record pulls, what would you say about that then? Well, there's so much. Uh, do you know the, the album, uh, the Isley Brothers album called Harvest for the World? Yes. So uh, it was in the 70s, and it was soul music played with acoustic guitar, which you don't hear that often. And... Uh, We need to hear more of that. Did you notice the acoustic guitar in that track? And that vocal, oh, so there's this high voice. And as a psychologist, if I may digress for just a moment, we ask the question, why do women like men who sing in a falsetto? Why are, I know, Eddie Kendricks and, and, the, and Tommy Jordan, uh, uh, folks who can just sing up there really high, what is that? conveying? Uh, possible answers, because it hasn't been tested. A possible answer is that a man who can sing in a high voice is saying, I'm approachable. I'm not threatening. I don't have this deep, growly voice. Although women, in the laboratory, women prefer men with deep voices. It's, it's a sign of testosterone, and, and women prefer it. But when we hear a male sing in that high falsetto, It can be irresistible. Oh, um, vocals, yeah, you, think, you know what I'm saying. And, and the same for men, it's, it's a, a woman with a very breathy voice. Because for men, it's signaling 
the woman is signaling, I can be nurturing and gentle to your children. I will nurture your offspring. I won't be screaming at your kids all the time. There'll be peace in the home. But a man who can sing in a high voice might be saying, uh, I'm not a threatening male. But it might also be that he's signifying that he's got a lot of power. He's, a man is naturally going to sing in his chest voice, so if a man can go up to his head voice, he's got that full can of whoop-ass. He's got, he's got an extra gear. And likewise, a woman who naturally sings in her head voice, if she can drop down and do a whole vocal in her chest voice, it's sexy because it's saying, I've got more than the average singer. So there's something about that vocal. There's something about that hi-hat that's just pushing the beat a little bit and then the claps that are just a little bit behind the beat. And then there's that thing that soul music does so well, the tension comes from not moving. In rock music, there are great dynamics. It's verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And then you take a turn around the bend for the bridge, and then it's chorus, or maybe a breakdown verse. And it's the dynamics where we push and pull. But in soul music, the tension comes from, stay right there, just stay right there. And those are the two words that Prince used to say to his band all the time in rehearsal. When they'd get in the sweet spot with the groove, he'd say, don't move don't move. And that just feels so good. And that song does that perfectly. So this rhythm track is just holding steady. It's just that beautiful steady pulse, which our bodies lock onto really easily, because that's the easiest path to hook a listener is the, the motor path. And then above it, you've got this lead line floating like a dolphin over the current. You've got this flute line. It's coming up and down. It's pretty and it's hypnotic. And then on top of that, you've got this high voice and that breath and that power that he's got. And then you've got his message, I'm living for the love of you. It's, you know, romantic. It's kind of got it all. <laughs> for, for those of us who like soul music, that's scratching that itch in a perfect way. So when you described it in that way, was that the engineer talking, the music fan? someone who had piano lessons or the doctorate? Um, I think, first of all, um, a music fan, which we all are, which is why we're here. You know you love something, and you might learn how to make that thing that you love if you're going to do this for a living. You love it so much you want to do it for a living. You actually want to make it, and you want listeners to have that response to a thing you've made. So you, you set out, you set out to do this, and we were talking about it at lunch. You don't necessarily know what you're doing, <laughs> at least not consciously. You might not be able to describe what you're doing. Somewhere inside you, there's a decision, a set of decision criteria that just says this feels right. You don't know where that came from, but you just know you have a. This feels right. This is wrong. Deviations from this is wrong. This is right to me. But then later, after I earned my degree, I learned a little bit more about how people bond to music. And I learned about the formal elements in music that do attract listeners. So I can, I can talk about it from a science perspective, but also from a, a record maker's perspective, and also from a fan's perspective. All of those perspectives are valid and true and accurate. They're just, it, they just use different language. Well, can you recall when you first had that feeling that, oh, this is me, this is something I want to do? You know, I think it might have been when I realized this isn't me. And that was um, the Beatles. I was seven years old and the Beatles were really popular. And I remember you know, I had my first Beatles record and thinking, this, I don't, I remember thinking, I don't get it. This isn't really doing it for me. But you don't want to say anything because you're seven and, you know, they're the Beatles and you don't want to be ostracized in second grade. But I, I just kind of remember thinking, I love music, but this just isn't speaking to me the way it seems to speak to other people. And then I remember hearing Sly Stone on the radio. And then it's like, now that's what I'm talking about. And just feeling like, Yeah, now this feels a little bit more right to me. And I remember being about nine years old and hearing the long version of Buffalo Springfield's um, Bluebird, Stephen Stills. Listen to my Bluebird laugh. And it was a long version on FM radio. And at the end, he goes into this blues thing and he starts moaning. And he's going, ugh. And I remember thinking, yeah, 
Now that's right. So uh, that's why I, th- I think that as children, we know who we are. Adults usually get in the way, and society and social pressures get in the way and kind of shape us or push us to liking this band or that band. You want to be like these kids. You like these kids better, and they happen to listen to that kind of music. But the musical street you live on is actually over there. Um, I, th- I, th- I think we know it when we're young. I mean, you were in California at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So, and you ended, I mean, your f- first um, professional forays were in an environment which was about as Californian as it could get. Could you elaborate on where you got your first jobs? Um, I wanted to, I knew as a, as a child that I wanted to make records. Uh, I was passionate about music and, and I, loved, I loved records, but I also knew I wasn't cut out to be Uh, a music maker myself. I wasn't. I wasn't a musician. I took piano lessons, and I just kind of thought, you know, I I don't like this. <laughs> this is not pleasurable. And it's like to paraphrase David Sedaris, it's like a system that results in pleasure for absolutely no one. A perfect blend between sadism and masochism. I hate this. Anyone listening to it hates it. <laughs> this is no good. Um, but I, I somehow had this vague notion that I wanted to be where music was being made. So. I got this, um, I, there was an ad in the LA Times that said audio trainee wanted for a company uh, called Audio Industries Corporation. They sold and serviced MCI consoles and tape machines. So I joined them when I was 21 years old as a trainee and I knew, I basically knew one end of a battery from the other and that was about it. And uh, But I was studying really, really hard uh, buying textbooks and electronics manuals and working to work my way into the music industry as a technician. Seeing that the internet wasn't around then, how did you get a hold of those manuals and all that like factual knowledge? I had um, a friend, he was a boyfriend, and uh, he was a bit of an electronics genius and um, exceptionally bright. And he learned electronics from an, a manual from the U.S. Army. So he said, you know, the Army teaches recruits electronics. They need recruits to, to be into electronics. They'll send you this for free. Just call them up and ask them. Tell them you're going to join the Army. So I did. I phoned the local Army recruiter, and I lied about my age. I said, I'm 16 years old, and when I get out of high school, I'm going to join the Army. Can you send me your electronics manuals? And the guy goes, well, sure, little lady. What's your address? And I sent them $1.75 in postage, and a few weeks later, a big box with all these electronics manuals, courtesy of the U.S. government. So you didn't even need WikiLeaks for that? It just came no, like that? No, no, it just came. The government has all these resources, and I needed to. I realized, you know, I, I didn't flatter myself to think that I could be an engineer, much less a producer. That never crossed my mind. But I wanted to I wanted to help. I wanted to do something. And I realized that I, I can study, and I can learn, and I'm good at memorization, I'm good at reading, that I can take the way my brain works I can apply it in service of music, and maybe someone will want my services. So I, that's what I did. I just I studied. I bought modern recording techniques. If you don't have it, you should. They're up to, I think, like their eighth edition right now. But I had the first edition, and I learned a lot from that book, and books on acoustics, and um, just basic principles of sound design. So later on, we will have a recommended reading list yes. that we can pull out. Um, who were the folks that you would get in contact with at that time at that job? Because LA, I guess, was sort of a happening town for music. Yeah, so. the year was 1978, and at that time there were uh, more than 500 studios in the greater Los Angeles area. There was a little bit of a crisis in the music business at that time, and some of the studios were going down. I was really fortunate. I was able to see Gold Star where um, Pet Sounds, a lot of Pet Sounds was recorded there at Gold Star, right? Stevie Wonder used to work there. A studio called Crystal, uh, where Stevie Wonder used to work. There was a studio called Angel City Sound, where the Beatles had worked. And and some of these studios were just dropping, 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 Wally Hiders. But I saw some of them in the late 70s before they they went down. That was the end of the rock and roll era and the beginning of New Wave and a new dawning in music, and artists like Prince were just starting to emerge. Um, 
So with Audio Industries, uh, I worked on, it was a very popular tape machine, the MCI. They were like, they weren't as good as the Studer, not by a long shot, but the Studer was like the Cadillac and the MCI was like the Ford. Everybody had one and they were fairly easy to work on. So um, yeah, there were studios all over the city with MCI consoles and tape machines and I was trained to become a technician. I repaired consoles and tape machines when, when they went down. Um, when someone sees footage from that time, and I mean even in popular things like mainstream movies like Neil Diamond's jazz singer or whatever, there's always a scene when they go to LA to go to a real studio. And you're like, what is this, a swimming pool from today's standards? It's like places that seem to be like a multitude of this side, this room right here. And they got like full orchestras in there and stuff. Yeah. It's like, And so those were the places oh, that you entered as a 21-year-old? Yeah, and it was just, I, we had the sense, other myself and folks like Ed Cherney and others who were just starting out, Dave Jordan and people who were just starting out around that time, we knew that it was kind of, we're seeing, um, we were seeing the end of one era and the beginning of another. Not so much for studios, because studios kept alive for another two decades, the 80s and 90s, but the music industry was changing and the old rock dinosaurs were dying out. So the studios were still there though. We saw, and it's still there, Capitol and RCA and studios that were affiliated with record labels, as well as the legendary places like Sunset Sound, which is still there. Paramount, still there. A lot of those places are still there. Village Recorder, United Western, where Frank Sinatra used to work, which became Ocean Way, and is now, I think it's East West Studios now. Um, a lot of those rooms are still there. How intimidating did you find those spots? Um, with For myself and for many of us, uh, our heads were in the clear ether of youth. <laughs> we were 21 years old and we thought we belonged there. <laughs> so there's some hubris. You know, you're feeling like, yeah, this is going to be great. And, uh, and you don't know anything. And you're trying really hard to not screw up because you want to stay around just long enough that they'll teach you a few things and they'll value you and, and they'll want you there. So... Yeah, there had to, I think for everyone starting out, there has to be a great deal of, you have to have guts, and, and you have to be a little bit egotistical. On some level, you have to say, this is totally going to work. I'm totally going to make it. And then on the other hand, you have to be able to say, you have to know, you have to have the realization that the odds are against you. So you're going to have to do something right to keep, it working. So it's kind of, I think guiding your career early is um, knowing when to hit the brakes, when to hit the gas pedal, knowing how fast to take the turns, knowing when to slow down. You, you really have to manage your career rather successfully early on. So yeah, we, we had a certain cockiness, but I, I'm not going to say that I was confident when I walked into some multi-million dollar facility to repair some guy's console that cost him You know, the console cost more than his house. Back then, in the early 80s, those consoles sold for three and four hundred thousand dollars. A tape machine was forty thousand dollars. And I was, at the time when I was, you know, really getting good at it, I was 23 years old. And I, it was, disco was popular. And I was, sometimes I would go to work in high heels. <laughs> and it was very, I know, it was, uh, it was, It wasn't the norm. I didn't have the plaid shirt and the pocket protector necessarily because why would I? I was a young woman. Um, but as long as I knew what I was doing, the tape machine didn't care what I was wearing. So, yeah, you have to have a little bit of hubris, and, but you have to really be able to deliver. You have to know what you're doing. How did you learn to navigate like the balance between the hubris and the healthy, sane approach? Oh, by being embarrassed, by getting, by making mistakes, uh, by being an idiot, but just enough of an idiot that it's not so bad that people um, will forgive you and they think that you're worth a second chance. Um, someone said to me um, recently, he's got two kids who are college age, and he said, I don't think the youth of today are being given the license to make as many mistakes as they once did. And I don't know if that's true or not. I know back in when I was young, um, we were allowed to make mistakes provided that 
um, we showed we had we had the right stuff. We had to demonstrate that we learned from our mistakes. We had to demonstrate the necessary humility. Um, I'll share with you something that Tony Maserati, the record producer, said recently at a at a keynote address. He was taking Q and A from the audience, and he said, "Let me tell you guys, if you're under 30 years old, and you like to go out, you like to socialize, you like to go to parties, you like to have fun, you don't." belong in the studio. You should not be a record maker. You might be an A&R person. You might be a manager. But you shouldn't be thinking about a career in music. He said, if you're under 30 years old, you have to be studying. And he used the word study every night, every weekend. Whenever you have discretionary time, you must be honing your skills. You must be learning your craft. Because it's so hard to do. And that's what I was doing every night and every weekend I was studying. Interesting that you mentioned him because a lot of people that worked with him would always say, I came up under Tony Maserati. So it seems like there's a clear hierarchical thinking in the same way as it used to be with like, let's say painters or yeah. um, high scale photographers or whatever, where you have this master apprentice sort of relationship. Yes, that is it exactly. It's still the old school methods I think still apply where it is kind of a master and an apprentice. Um, when you're young, someone sees something in you and people are egotistical, we must, might as well admit it. What they see in the young version, in the young you is a younger version of themselves. They see themselves and they recognize it and they say to themselves, you remind me of me when I was young. I recognize you. I'm going to take you under my wing and I'm going to teach you. They will allow you to make mistakes If you're making the same kinds of mistakes they made, if your mistakes are completely off the rails and they don't know where you're coming from, they'll probably say, you know, I, I don't recognize you. And Tony Maserati said when he does have really talented young people who are not like him, who want to party on the weekends, he'll tell them, I think you're, you're cut out for this business, but not the studio business. I think you should be in the music industry, but in a different role. But do you think that sort of hierarchical thinking still has a place in the 21st century? It worked. So I don't see why we, we wouldn't continue to do it. I, I assume it does. I don't think humans change that fast. And systems that work tend to stay in place for good reason. So I can't see that that would be overturned. Because what would, what would be the substitute? Like, if you didn't have that system, you'd have what we have, which is like Berkeley College of Music, schools, where you go to a school and you learn to be, you learn jazz composition or film scoring, or you learn record production, you learn mixing. That doesn't make you a mixer. It doesn't make you a film scorer. You still have to go out and enter this system And the system is going to vet you. It's going to test you to see whether or not you're worthy. And it's the same thing for musical artists. What you're kind of, what musicians are coming up under, oddly, it's like a circle that goes back to back to the basics. Your boss is the public, the record buying public. You'll come up under and be kind of kind of be given license almost to practice your art if enough people like you. So it's very humbling, isn't it? I mean, and interestingly I mean, enough in a culture where people seem to get a lot of their daily validation for existence out of the number of digital likes they're gathering, how do would you recommend someone keeping their mental sanity as a human being in in that I think it's really important to define success for yourself. I think you should say, what would success look like and feel like to me? You don't know whether or not you're going to like it if you get it, and you might not. A friend of mine said, um, sometimes you don't get the dream you want. Sometimes you get the dream you didn't know you had. So sometimes your life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. It turns out actually better than you thought it would. Um, You, you, should, you, should, you should know yourself well enough to know what you want. Joni Mitchell said, do you want to be an artist or do you want to be a star? Because 
there's the Venn diagram of those two things. It's not perfect overlap. Do you want to be a star? You should acknowledge that. If, if success means fame, then you should admit it to yourself and you should shape your music to help you get that. And if success means being known by other musicians, that's a different, you'll make different choices in your career. Um, I talk with students about how there are three primary audiences for music, and you can be a success with just one of them, and that'll do, but they're very different. And the three audiences, to my way of thinking, are the general public that's looking for a certain thing in their music. Another audience, however, is the music critics and the scholars. The scholars are looking for something different, just like movie critics like different movies than the general public likes. Uh, because the scholars have the history of where art has been and they can predict where it's going to go and they critique art based on a standard of all art. But then the third audience is your peers, other musicians. At Berkeley, we see a lot of kids who fall into the trap of playing to impress other musicians. Other musicians hear music very differently than the general public. So I think the youth of today should should define success. Does it include marriage? Does it include children? Does it include living in a really expensive city like London or LA or New York? Does it include waking up every day and being at work? Do you want to wake up and have a studio in your home? Or do you want to wake up and drive to where you work? Does it include... Do you want to have a spouse who's in the same industry as you? Do you want to fall asleep at night and put your head on the pillow and talk shop? Some people love that. Some people hate it. Uh, do you want to have employees? Do you, do you know what? What do you want? Uh, I, I I think that's important for beginners starting out before they really get themselves down a road that they might not like. Before we <clears throat> embark on that train, using an example that sort of worked, um, you talked a lot about mistakes. Where do you see the threshold? When do you need to excuse? yourself publicly, personally, for mistakes that you may have committed? Or where is it better to just brush them over and hope it will sort itself out? Well, I think um, people do their best when, when they know themselves and when they're honest with themselves. Uh, if you're honest with yourself, if you can really define and describe yourself, ironically, that's first step toward being something else. <laughs> um, because it lays a foundation for change. So I think it's wise to admit our mistakes to ourselves and to others. Um, people who don't, however, uh, are often really, really successful. We see it in our politicians. We, we, see, it, we see it everywhere. So it's kind of hard to know for sure. I guess it depends on what you can live with and what your environment will support. Like, frankly, I mean, we're the music industry, think about it. You're making a product that no one needs. Humans can live without music. It's debatable whether or not we could thrive without it. But it's not like we're making bread or we're running electrical cable or we're, we're heating people's homes. We're making music, we're, we're, and it's something that they buy with their disposable income. So you're making a product that we don't need, and we already have too much of. There's too much music out there. Nobody wants it. Nobody's asking us, oh, give us more of that, because we don't have enough. So, <laughs> so wouldn't it behoove you, then, if you're going to compete and you're going to make this thing, you should be humble, and you should recognize that, you know, maybe it would behoove me to try to do something, to try and solve a problem, to try and achieve something with my art. And, and then in that case, you're, then, then mistakes are possible. You might be the kind of artist who makes music for a hobby or who doesn't care too much about selling it. In, in that case, there's no mistakes because it's just up to you. But as soon as you involve the magic words, other people, then it's possible to make mistakes because now we have a transfer function between you and other people. And you might drop the ball, you might mess up. I want to let that sink, for, sink in for a second. And maybe um, 
after that second, change the mood a little bit. So, what was that? <laughs> that was so amazing. So amazing to be with Prince at that time. He was 25 years old, making his sixth album. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and he, this, when he was 24, the year before, he went to his record label, Warner Brothers, and he said, I'm going to make my next record, and I'm also, I want to make a movie, too. And we'll release them both kind of at the same time. <laughs> Who does that? And what label says yes? But they did. They, they believed in him enough. And that, 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 you know, he was just climbing. He had just had his first crossover hit with Little Red Corvette on the previous album on 1999. So it could have tanked his career. But he just had the guts to say, no, I think this is going to work. And just did it. That song was recorded in the warehouse uh, rehearsal. We didn't have a proper studio yet. It, 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 in Minneapolis, he had, uh, there was a little bedroom across from the master bedroom in his home that had a tape machine and a console in it, and that's where he did some of the Purple Rain album. And then there was a rehearsal space, so just a warehouse, really, where he would set up with the band. And all the mics on the stage would feed a splitter snake, and then the output of the splitter snake fed a monitor mix console, and then it also fed an API recording console, and then the outputs of that I wired up to a tape machine so we could record rehearsals. There was no isolation, so the console and where the band played, there's no isolation, it's all right there. So to monitor, I just had to listen to headphones or stick my head right in front of the loudspeaker to try and hear it. Um, and you couldn't hear it anyway because the band was, it was just so loud. But we would record the basic track with the band on stage. He'd keep the girls around, like Wendy and Lisa, to do backing vocals. And then he and I stayed up the whole rest of the night and finished the song and printed it to two track. That sounds like it was long hours. Uh, typically with him, uh, it was typically anywhere between 16 and 24. A 16 would be a fairly short session, but we frequently did 24 hours. That was fairly common. That was kind of how long it took because he never wanted to come back to a song. If he started it, he wanted to do all the overdubs and mixing it as we went and then print it and then it would be done. And then we'd sleep for a few hours and then start another song. How did you keep up like mentally, physically? Well, I, it was kind of easy and invigorating because I was a Prince fan. I was just so excited to be there. And with every song, with one exception, with every song, I was always thinking, this may be the greatest thing he's ever done. This is the greatest. Wait till people hear this. This is great. Just one after the other after the other. They were all so amazing. So there is, you take that clear ether of youth and you couple that with a little bit of training and preparation, and then you take that energy and you put it in an environment where people say, here's a lot of money, go ahead and make a movie, make a record, do whatever you want, and there doesn't have to be a producer in the room, it can be just you, artist, and your engineer, because we trust you. It's just so invigorating. Um, Prince didn't, well, I say this knowing what we know about how he died. Uh, at that time, he did not do drugs. Not at all, because he wouldn't have been able to stay up if he had done drugs. He was just healthy and young and strong, and every once in a while he'd have a cup of coffee, but we didn't want to make him coffee, because then we'd be up for another 24 hours. So, yeah. Also a lot of sugar one hears. Well, he kind of went through phases, but yeah, he had a sweet tooth. He, he lived on Doritos and cake. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that in my book. But. <laughs> yeah, he, he ate like a little kid at the time when I was with him. Um, when you showed up there in Minneapolis, you had done how many recordings, recording sessions? He, he, I'm sorry, he when had you, done or I had done? When you showed up there, yeah. Oh, I had done um, very few and mm. only basically as an assistant engineer. I, he hired me as his technician. He needed someone to, um, he asked his management, find me someone from New York or L.A. because the locals weren't as... Um, 
fluent in pro audio techniques, uh, the local Minneapolis folks. So he wanted someone from the industry, and I'd been in the industry five years now. At this point, I was working for Crosby, Stills & Nash, their studio in Hollywood. So I heard through the professional grapevine that Prince was looking for a technician, and I just jumped on it because I knew he liked working with women. He was my favorite artist in the world. And I wanted that job so badly, and I was qualified for it. So his management hired me. They interviewed me and hired me. So I had done practically no sessions. What I did was I pulled out, the first thing I did was I pulled out an old console and then installed a new one. I repaired his tape machine. Um, there was some stuff with his outboard gear that I fixed and just basically got the studio up and running so he could continue <laughs> recording on the Purple Rain record. And he just put me in the engineer's seat at that point because he didn't like to work with too many people. If you knew how the gear worked, he assumed you knew how to run it. So <laughs> be the engineer. That was really a dream come true. And did you have a moment of like, oh, oh shit, this is what we're doing? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, I remember the very first, I finally had finished setting up everything. And he gave me instructions to put up a vocal mic. And the vocal mic just happened to be, well, at that time it wasn't that rare, but now it's extremely rare. It was the tube U47, the Neumann. They're very expensive now. Yeah, just so beautiful. So I put up the tube mic for, to do a vocal and hung it on the boom stand over the console the way he, he said he wanted it. And I kept thinking, oh, no, the engineer's going to walk in any minute and catch me. And I'm going to be in so much trouble. And I'm going to have to tell this engineer, Prince told me to do it. I had to. And he told me to get a sound on the mic. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be fired now. This engineer is going to tell on me. But it was my boss who was telling me to do it. So I, so I, I did. I, I, I got a sound. Then he came in and, and finally I asked him, who's going to record it? And he said, you. So I said, okay. <laughs> Fair enough, chief. <laughs> Off we go. And then that's how it began. And it was, it, I had the dawning realization after a while that he doesn't know that I'm not an engineer. And then a second <laughs> dawning was he knows and he doesn't care. So um, yeah, I felt very fortunate every single day I was with him. How important do you find that unorthodox way of setting things up and running recording sessions contributed to the way his art translated onto record? It's really important, and I think that's a really important question. Um, people have asked me, or they've prefaced questions by saying, Prince was known to be a perfectionist, and I always have to correct them. He was not a perfectionist. We wouldn't, he wouldn't have had that output if he'd been a perfectionist. What he was was a virtuoso player and, and a genius with melody, a genius with rhythm, a genius at writing songs. It just poured out of him. He couldn't wait on perfection. The important thing was to have the sound serve the ideas, not the other way around. So working quickly was fine with him and only a beginning engineer would have no bad habits to break. Only a beginner would be willing to go that fast. With uh, an, an important record, the, the Gegita record that I did in the, in the mid-90s, put a fine point on that for me. I learned more about music from those guys than any people I'd ever worked with. Uh, Tommy Jordan and Greg Kirsten from Gegita. And, and with them, I learned that the rule book is for beginners. Once you know what you're doing, chuck it. Um, there were people who were instrumental in helping you to figure out which way he would have liked the rule book to be chucked, as in like people that would be working with him that showed you the ropes and ha gave, gave you a little bit of a hand? Yeah, that was Jesse Johnson from the time. Prince went out to Los Angeles to work on the Purple Rain movie Logistics, and he let Jesse and me use the studio. Jesse had some uh, tracks he wanted to record, and Jesse was instrumental to me keeping my job because he taught me, here's how Prince likes the kick drum to sound. Here's how he likes the snare to sound. Hi-hat always has to be on the left. Rhythm guitar has to sound like this. Electric guitar has to sound like that. He showed me on the console, this is Prince's sound. And, and we had a lot of conversations. He helped teach me Prince's value system. Um, what would that be? What we need music to do. So when, when you're mixing a record, you need to understand something about where you want your listener's attention to go. You need to 
kind of subconsciously, I suppose, understand how people, how you want people to move to this music? How would they dance to it? And the answer to those questions determines, is the bass louder than the kick drum? Or is the kick drum louder than the bass? Is the focus on the two and the four? Or is this focus on the one and the three in this song? Um, should the vocal be up? Should the vocal be down in the track? Where do we want people's attention to go? Because what do we want them to feel when they hear this? That's the value system uh, that, that is always in place for every artist. And Jesse helped me to transition from the LA sound that I knew into this Minneapolis sound that was really just the Prince sound that he was crafting for himself. This is who we are. There's an us and we sound like this. This band that you mentioned the time, how underrated do you think they are on a scale from zero to 10? The time is Prince. The time Prince wrote all those songs and performed all the instruments on the record, he'd have Jesse do a guitar solo, and he'd have Morris, um, Prince would sing a guide vocal, and then Morris would um, come in and, and just copy Prince's lead. So the time is just another one of Prince's musical personalities. Music is an expression of life, but it's not an artist's, it's not 100% of an artist's output. So music is only a part of Prince's life, and Prince music was only a part of the music of Prince's life. There was the time music, and there was Sheila E., and there was Vanity Six. They were his musical alter egos. So to answer your question, the time was just another version of Prince, and, and I don't know, the public didn't know at the time, because Prince didn't want it known. He didn't want it known that it was him, um, but Prince created his own competition for the purpose of making, and he's the first artist, as far as I know, to ever do that. Who does that? Create your own competition so that you can get the record-buying public to think that coming out of this town, Minneapolis, Minnesota, is a scene, not just one genius guy. So he created the time to be his competition, and then he wrote this movie to play them as the competition, and the prize they were fighting for was Vanity Six, which is another one of Prince's alter egos. So it's hard to answer the question Sounds of how like underrated very, very they were. Very healthy, small, balanced ego. Yeah, it's 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 not a it's not a balanced ego. I don't suppose everyone's missing something, but it's a multifaceted ego. Um, he was very masculine, and he was feminine in ways that a masculine man is. He had a feminine sensibility. He was very street and he was very sophisticated. And he had an artistic streak that a lot of people didn't give him credit for. One of the movies he loved was David Lynch's Eraserhead. Stuff like that. Um, yeah, he, he, was, he was a very really extraordinary, extraordinary human being. And I mean, in the end, that's using that example, um, that movie, And the soundtrack for that movie got him something that Ludacris boasts about 20 years later to be the first rapper to get a uh, Grammy and an Oscar. Prince did that 15, 20 yeah. years before that, right? Yeah, I don't know. He, he, he didn't, he, he, speaking of rap, he knew that it was coming and he knew that it was going to take over funk. And it was, I mean, in the 80s, it was already showing signs that this is where it's going to go, that rap and hip hop would become the dominant force. Um, that was difficult for him. It must have been difficult for Michael Jackson, too, to recognize that you're on the top of your game and the next wave is its about to crash over you. You'll always be good. You'll always be valid because you've done so much up to this point. But you're never going to be the... You will never again be the dominant art form because as in all art, the next wave is... It just comes and crashes on the beach right over you. But all these guys that were sort of like scratching at his throne... Um, would always obsess about how on earth does he get the drums to sound the way they sound, and especially the drum box that he uses, the LM1. Yeah. yeah. So um, seeing that we're sort of amongst friends, um, there were sort of some boss pedals, I guess, involved. Oh, in yeah. So what, what, it, what we did is the LM1 was different from the Lindrum, which is a better, more improved model. The LM1 had a, had a crystal clock, that wasn't quite as accurate as the next one, so the timing 
of the Lindrum, the old cheap Lindrum that Prince used, the LM1, um, it wasn't as robotic, it wasn't as rigid, and which made it slightly more human. When that thing would heat up, I think it would kind of speed up a little bit, it would drift a little bit, so there was that. And the other thing it had is that it had individual outputs for all of the sounds, kick, snare, hat, claps, clave, all the toms. So there were individual outputs. In the later model, the Lindrum, um, they only had individual outputs for some of them, and then the rest had to be combined in this little mixer. So Prince could take the LM1, and he could take the claps and run it through the flanger. He always had his guitar pedals. His guitar pedals were the boss, the Roland Boss pedals. So we would take his boss pedal board from his guitar rig and just plug it into the drum machine, the output of the drum machine, and we could send claps or snare or toms usually uh, and hi-hat, whatever we liked, through this mixture of the heavy metal pedal and the flanger and the chorus and the delay and the distortion. So dialing in on that pedal board, uh, dialing in a, a sound for the, for the percussion was one of the tricks that he invented and that others copied uh, in his work. How much money did you get offered for the settings of those pedals? Oh my gosh, no, no never anything. But I will tell you a story that uh, was kind of telling about him, uh, Prince's Guitar Tech, this might have been around the Parade album, thought it would be really great if Prince had a much more sophisticated guitar sound and setup. So there was a guy, and I, don't, I honestly don't remember the guy's name, but it was a guy who made really sophisticated guitar setups. And we were working at Sunset Sound in Los Angeles, so this guy came in to demo the new Prince's potentially new guitar rig. Very, very expensive, very sophisticated. And the guy needed hours to set up, and Prince wouldn't stop working to give the guy the time. So he said, well, you can set it up, but I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. Just set it up and let me know when it's ready. So the guy spent hours setting up this rack. It was just a big rack and all these presets and all these outboard pieces of outboard gear that were very expensive and very sophisticated. And Prince walked up, picked up his guitar, played a chord, looks down at his feet, and then he says to the guy, how do I change settings? How do I change the delay, the chorus, the flange, the, the distortion, all the stuff that I like? And the guy says, oh, well, here's the beauty of it, Prince. You preset it for every song. So just tell me what song you want to play and then, and, and then I'll set that sound up for you. And Prince just set his guitar down, walked into the room, and said to the, his guitar tech, he says, tell him to go. <laughs> Prince liked having the pedal board there because in the, when inspiration struck on stage or in the studio, he could just reach down and just dial it in. So the settings changed constantly, all the time. They, they changed during the recording of a song sometimes. You just play with it. You hit the pedals on and off. Nevertheless, there's certain staples that you somehow find in a lot of different songs from different eras, like a certain type That's of... That's true. Yeah. And um, is that something that as you, as the um, recording engineer in the room, knew like, oh, now he wants that sort of thing going on here on the kick, or like, oh, he wants to snare that, and is that something you would prepare before you go into? He liked, when he went into a session, he liked to have everything set up and everything possible so that he could dial it in, or have me dial it in, as the song required. So as songs were taking shape, I, I didn't know what we were doing, and I would change sounds as the song was coming into being. Um, I had mentioned before, record makers are going to manipulate the listener's attention, and so and when I'm realizing this is a ballad, I know what kind of reverbs he wants on ballads. And when I'm realizing, okay, we're doing a dance song now, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be slightly different. And so while his hands were playing, my hands can be tweaking sounds to get them to be compatible with what I think he's going to want. But he was very hands-on, so he was always doing the same thing. And especially when it came to his pedal board and the drum machine sounds, he was the one who was dialing those in. I, I, I had them all available for him, but I wasn't pre-setting those sounds for him. I would like to move on to the next album and play a piece of music, but um, I'd be curious why you chose exactly the title track of an album that had things on it like Pop Life and Raspberry Beret and The Ladder, or something that's very um, fitting right now, America, or Condition of the Heart, which is probably one of the more interesting ones, but you went for the title track. Before we listen to it, why should people care about Around the World in a Day? The reason I chose it is because I think it is 
one of the core songs on that album. And because of the message that it conveys, um, Prince believed rightly that when you're making a record, you're not going to make a record of 12 great songs. You're being realistic. People don't make albums of 10 or 12 great songs because great is a really big word. When you make an album, every song, in his view anyway, had a seed, the kernel, which was six songs, three or four really, realistically, that formed the heart of that record. The other songs were either written or chosen, rewritten, revamped, to complement the seed. So he just finished his Purple Rain, and he's a huge success, and he's won Grammys, and he won an Academy Award, and he knows that he's peaked. He was smart enough to know that things go in cycles, and that after you peak, now artistically, you're probably going to sell less with the next record. So now's a good time to have a transitional record to help, to help signify, here's where we're going next. So on Around the World in a Day, on the cover, he abandons the purple for a rainbow kind of thing. He's pledging no allegiance to any particular color. And this opening track, Around the World in a Day, is using uh, musical instruments that are different f from him, for him, uh, using more cello and using the little uh, finger cymbals that are popular in the Middle East. And he's saying, now there's a bigger us. I'm a bigger star than I was before. Let's restart the conversation. And I think even the tempo of it is signifying a beginning. It's, it's kind of an opening of the next phase in his artistic life. I think it's important that way. That's another one that was recorded at rehearsal with the band on stage and just an open warehouse space. Rehearsals were pretty important to him, right? Making music, is, it's, he, was, he was fiendishly, fiendishly attracted to making music. If he was awake and not eating or sleeping, which he did very little of, and not on the phone having a business meeting, he had an instrument in his hand. It's, I can, do I have a minute? Can I tell people what a typical day was like so you can, you can know what this guy was like? Let, let me give you a typical day on, on tour. So in a big, big tour, it's probably still the same way today, in a big arena tour, you have sound check. And usually sound check, after you've got it dialed in, usually sound check takes 20, 30 minutes tops. That's what bands do. They sound check for 20 or 30 minutes. And then they have the dinner break, and then there's doors, and then there's the opening act, and then the headliner takes the stage, and the headliner plays, it can be 45 minutes if they're really cheap, but it can be an hour and a half, two hours, and if they're really giving you your money's worth, they'll play for two and a half hours. And then that's the end of it. And then they go out and they party. Prince would have a four-hour sound check just for the fun of it to play new songs, just to have some fun. So we would sound check from 2 in the afternoon uh, until 6 p.m. He'd leave the stage from 6 to 6.30. The opening act would do their 30-minute sound check. There'd be the dinner break. There'd be doors. Uh, when he would hit the stage, it'd be about 9 o'clock because the opening act was 8.30 to 9. So Prince would hit the stage at 9 o'clock, and he'd play until 11.30, two and a half hour set. The last song would be Purple Rain. He'd leave the band doing the coda on stage. He'd come down off the stage, get into a little van. The van would take him to his hotel. He would shower and change and do one of two things. We would either go into a recording studio and work all night, or um, we would play an after party. So there was a little truck, a small truck, that had a second set of instruments, and I knew what we were doing ahead of time. I'd either meet him at the studio or I'd meet him at this small club. And then at 1 o'clock in the morning, he'd come in. I'd, I have to go, of course, because I have to set stuff up. I have to go directly from the gig to the studio or to the club and either mix front of house at the club um, or, or record with him all night long until the next day, until the sun was well up and it was time to get on a plane or the bus to go to the next city and do it all over again. He, this was on the road because after playing you know, for all day, he still didn't have enough and he wants to be with people, but he was socially awkward and he didn't want to just be with people and talk. He wanted 
his way of being with people was to play. He, he just wanted to be playing. But sometimes we had records to do, and he had songs in his head that were coming so fast, he had to have access to a studio to record them. So we would do that on tour. That was on tour. If we were home, um, it was wake up in the morning, and uh, if it was morning, or wake up after a few hours of sleep. Four hours was a full night for him. Wake up after his customary four hours of sleep, make a few phone calls, have his hair done, or whatever it was he was going to do. And uh, after being up for a few hours, I would get the call telling me to meet him at the studio, and he would Sometimes he would tell me what to set up for him. Sometimes I'd find a note. Other times, if there was no note, I'd just have everything set up. So it might be acoustic drums, or it might be drum machine, or whatever. Um, but it would be set up, and he'd come in, and we'd start to work. And 20, 24 hours later, we'd be done. He'd go to bed. I'd make his cassette copy. I'd sleep my customary three hours. And then the phone would ring, and there'd be the, I'd pick up the phone, and his voice would go, Ready? <laughs> Yeah, and then it would go all over again. And where did that leave you as a private person? I had no, I, I had no life other than it, we used to call it other employees, and I would call it our tour of duty. I, it was my tour of duty, and I was with him over four years. It was going on our fifth year together, and and I was exhausted, still exhilarated, but I had I had done as much as I possibly could, and that was a long run with him. Because uh, I was by his side for all those years, and you know whether we were doing a movie or we were on tour, or I was his employee. So if he was awake, he's making music. So I was right there. Uh, I was I was quite exhausted by the end of it, and I needed I, I needed to have a proper life, but it was good while it lasted. Well, I mean, just for context, at this time, disguises competition. Most of the people you'd know today, like Metallica, were still playing dive bars around then. Mm. Um, his competition would be Michael Jackson, Madonna, Bruce Springsteen, and that was about it. Like, and then this guy comes out with his next artistic statement being this or the album afterwards. Was there any reasoning as you facilitating that in the studio going like, oh my gosh, that's either super brave or suicide? Yeah, he was always, he was always, he was bold. He was bold artistically. And he's like any artist, he wanted to be loved. He wanted people to like him. He wanted people to like his music. There was an ongoing rivalry with Michael Jackson. And this was sad because it was perceived by the general public that Michael was the good guy. He was the safe guy. He was the guy that, you know, you could send out on a date with your 15-year-old daughter and she'd be safe. You'd let him babysit your children. Michael was the good guy. And Prince was perceived as being somehow threatening. And I remember somebody said to me once, he was an assistant engineer at Sunset Sound, and he was talking about Bruce Springsteen and Prince, and he said, I like Bruce Springsteen better. And the guy said, I get the feeling that if I met Bruce, he'd sit down and he'd have a beer with me. I have a feeling that, he said, if I met Prince, he'd steal my girlfriend. <laughs> so there were these perceptions about Prince that he was, you know, this, this, this bacchanal and that he was, there was always a bacchanal and that he was this sexual predator. He was the opposite. The truth was he was a working man who went to work every day and that's basically all he did. He dated, but it was usually women that he was around, like Vanity and Susanna Melvoin and Jill Jones and Sheila E. And He was just a working man and he also was sober as a judge, so your kids would have been really safe with Prince. Do you think there were racial undertones in those sort of um, perceptions? There might have been, in the United States anyway. I don't know about elsewhere in the world, but in the United States there were certainly stereotypes about African-American artists, and Prince was singing about sex. But one of the things that was lost on some people, not on his fans, but on a lot of people, they didn't really get that when Prince was singing songs about sex, he was giving power to women. Do Me Baby is the archetypal example of this. Do Me Baby was just a, a B-side of a single, but Do Me Baby was him saying to the woman, you do me, you, B 
be the guy. You be the aggressor. You do me. And he's saying how much he loves it when she has all the power. All of his songs from the, uh, if you've got bootlegs, you've heard it. It's called We Can Fuck. But all of those songs are about, and it's, it's brilliant, by the way. All of those songs are about us. It, he never ever took a predatory stance in his seduction. He, it was never about, I am going to conquer you, my prey. It was always, he always approached women as equals. And I think that's one of the reasons that women loved him so much. We trusted him. We felt safe with him. We felt empowered. We felt equal. Um, he, 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 he gave us that, and he always did. He was always consistent with that. That's who he was. On that note, I think we should leave the um, chronological order for a second because um, he also adored other artists and female artists as well. And I think there's um, something that is the segue here. So rumor has it that was a rather popular record around Paisley Park. Prince played the groove off that record. He played the record a lot. He loved Kate Bush and Joni Mitchell, and uh, he, loved, uh, he loved women artists. Um, if I may, if I may get all pedantic on your ass uh, for just a moment, I'd like to share something with you that uh, I teach the students. Um, I was talking as a psychologist a little bit earlier about how people bond to music and psychologists know that there are three basic ways that a song can get us. And the first is the mo simplest pathway, which is the motor, just the rhythm, you know? Al Green, Isley Brothers, it, it just feels good rhythmically. We can bond to a record and love it for the rhythm track alone, and hip hop has taken that principle and dominated music for the last 20 years or so uh, on rhythm-oriented music. The second path, however, is melody and harmony, and and melody and harmony, since time immemorial, Beethoven had nary a drum kit, but with melody and harmony, uh, we can love that melody so much that it becomes the music of us, and we bond to it and we love it. But the third way that people will bond to music and identify with it is to cognition, cognitive processes, which is music makes you think, and typically that's done by the lyrics. So the value in this record is not the rhythm track, it's just that basic pulse that's going throughout, it's drum machines, there's not much variance there. It's not the melody, not the harmony, you're not going to really learn the chord changes of that, and it's not going to become a jazz standard. What's great about it, and why he liked it, and is aside from just the, the production elements, it's a well-made record, but the lyrics, she's saying, if I only could, I'd make a deal with God and I'd get him to swap our places. Rather bold in 1986 or whenever it was when that came out, it might have been 85. And then it's that bridge where she says, come on, angel, come on, darling, let's exchange the experience. And she's presumably talking to a lover and she's saying, let me be you. Let me see what it feels like to be the man and you be the woman. Let's exchange the experience. It's rather brilliant. And uh, record making involves finding what's good about it, finding the great element. Is it your rhythm track? Is it your melody? Do people, will people want to learn the chord changes to this song? Is it the harmony? Great session musicians will do that for you. Uh, or, or is it the lyrics? If you're a Bob Dylan and you win the Nobel Prize for literature, if your lyrics are 10 on a 10 scale, then you don't need to be funky, do you? And you don't, and you, you don't really need to have great melodies, good melodies. But what are you selling? You're selling the words. And if you're James Brown, you can say, hot pants give you confidence. <laughs> the lyrics don't have to be Nobel Prize worthy <laughs> because you're so funky. Uh, that's what you're selling. Uh, I think Prince knew that. Uh, on some level. He knew with each one of his songs, with each one of his tracks, which elements were carrying the musical weight. But it was sort of proficient in a lot of those different arenas and... Yeah, it's, I, I would argue that he, I think arguably you might say he's, he was not necessarily a genius with lyrics. He wrote a good line, but compared to others, I don't know that he was a genius with lyrics, but I, I think he was certainly a genius with rhythm. And one of the things he did better than just about anyone else, he was peerless in his capacity to turn out hooks. 
And it was I mean, melodic hooks, one after the other after the other. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to think that someone could write that many good hooks and not repeat himself. Yeah, there's these, there were these moments when he did these shows in L.A. where he would treat this arena as a club show and do like these jams for hours. And then because people came for the hits as well, he would just go to the grand piano and do like a 15-minute medley of like, oh, yeah, and then I did this. And this, and it would just be hook after hook. It's like hearing DJ Kali play, but yeah, just yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, really otherworldly. I mean, just really astonishing. And his, his own line, when he did turn a good line, like on Sometimes It Snows in April, he said, those kinds of cars don't pass you every day. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary artist. I'm glad he's getting a lot of attention now. Um, I'm not so sure what I would totally... Um, be alright with you downplaying his storytelling skills because on the back of Running Up That Hill I would like to move on to the next album and a song that has sort of a similar idea going on and play this one. You can hear those boss pedals, you can hear that slow flanger on the drums, and you can hear the snare is on this one just completely dry, and I, I had switched to a new compressor around that time. I started using the uh, 1176 on the snare, and he was letting me play around a little bit more, but you hear the obvious distortion on the vocal as well, and that was an accident. Do you feel bad about that accident? Well, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was bad. I just had the preset. The presets at this console at Sunset Sound that weren't continuous. It was discrete knobs in 10 dB steps, and I accidentally had it set to 10 dB too hot. And Prince liked to do his vocals completely alone in the control room. He didn't want anyone else there, so I would set up the signal path for him and patch, put a piece of tape on the patch cord that he needed to move to get himself to the next track if he was going to do backing vocals, arm the track that he needed into record, and then I would go wait in the next room while he did the vocal. So I didn't hear it as it was going down, but you hear that API preamp is clipping at the top. And uh, I thought he was going to be furious when he heard it back, not in headphones, but in the speakers. And he liked it. He used to say, you know, we don't sound like those other people. We don't sound like Michael Jackson. We don't spend all that kind of money. We go fast. We make mistakes. <laughs> so he was okay with it. Uh, I was kind of mortified. But you hear the high pitch on the voice. That's, uh, that was done back in those days by very speeding the tape machine. Was that on purpose? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you very speed the machine to get the timbre that you want. You can go the other direction, too. Like, you can get a bass to sound really, really fast fat if you would speed up the tape machine and then play it you know in the different key and then set it back to the set standard speed and then you'd have that low tone and it would be great and you could do the same thing you can slow the track way way down sing a vocal and then when you bring the speed back up to where it's supposed to be you get that high thin voice that he liked so he he put on a character he, be, he became kind of a character in timbre in order to say something that he really meant. He was dating Susanna Melvoin at the time. I think it's fairly safe to say because they were in a really close relationship at this time. And she has a twin sister, Wendy Melvoin. And twins are really, really close. And I think Prince may have, this may have been, it's always conjecture, but I'm supposing that he's trying to say, I wish I could have the relationship with you that you have with your sister. I wish we could be that tight. Uh, it, it was a, a bad choice to release it as a single. Prince, I had talked earlier about audiences, and he was trying at this point on the Sign of the Times album to um, win back some black radio. He needed more black radio airplay, and he did the song Sign of the Times. He did a door on this record, and, and he, was, he was trying to win back his core audience. So he did some things on this record that would have been appealing to that audience, but some things that would have turned that audience off. Uh, in uh, most African Americans in the city, in the United States, wouldn't necessarily think it was cool for a guy to say, naked 
for you, naked, I will dance a ballet. Not cool. <laughs> maybe in certain communities of uh, different populations, maybe in New York or whatever, but for most people, not cool. <laughs> so it was kind of a mixed bag, I think, for him. But he was an artist to his core, so he did what he thought was, was cool and hoped it would be cool for others. What is the final line there? Imagine. Then together we'll stare into silence and try to imagine what it looks like. What does that mean? I don't know. Do we need to know, actually? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. We started talking about it when we started. Um, does, does the consumer's going to decide for themselves what they think it means? And that's part of the beauty of it, isn't it? Like, the artist doesn't have to reveal what it means. You don't need for people to get it. It can be kind of great if, they, if it is what they think it is. A.K. Okay, Wonderwall. Yeah, or or as simple as a hamburger, you know. If you if you you don't know what the chef tried to do, you just know what it is to you, and that's all that matters. Um, <clears throat> on the notion of hamburgers, um, where he absolutely butchered drum machine programming and put generations of hip hop and techno artists to tears, is another track on this album. Um, can you tell us how the drums on the ballad of Dorothy Parker were recorded? That was another mistake. Uh, <laughs> the track sounds very dull. Uh, we listened to Kate Bush a moment ago, and I was thinking, man, wh I wonder where the filter setting was on the high-pass filter on her voice. I know from people who worked with her that she would just boost 5K like mad, and she would sing her vocal through this little Fostec semi-pro preamp to get that really bright, bright, bright vocal because it, it cut through on radio. It was great. Lots of 5K. But the opposite was true on the ballad of Dorothy Parker, and it was a mistake, but as it turned out... The song is about a dream. It was inspired by a dream he had, so it sort of worked. Uh, we were uh, installing a new console in his home studio, a custom-made console, and Paisley Park was being built, but it wasn't finished yet. So the fellow who designed this console, whose name was Frank Demidio, Frank came in from Los Angeles, and he's hooking it all up, and Prince couldn't take it anymore. He was just dying to record, and he told me to send Frank home. He says, if it's just, it, just send him home. I just, I got to work. So we put Frank on a plane and we sent him home and Prince came downstairs and said the magic words, fresh tape, and put up fresh tape. And we started recording this song and as soon as I heard it, I realized, oh my God, because there was no high end. It was the opposite of Kate Bush. There was <laughs> low pass filters on everything is what it sounded like. The drums, everything he played, there was, first I was thinking it was just one channel and then I realized, one track I should say, it, it wasn't, it was, it was the whole console. And I'm thinking, oh, please stop so I can get out the voltmeter and see what's going on with this console. But he wouldn't stop. And he just kept going and going and going and going. It was like a baby eating <laughs> baby food. It's like, when's it gonna stop? <laughs> it just kept going and going and going. And then we finished the song and then we mixed it. He didn't stop, which was typical of him, but I kept thinking, you know, isn't he noticing that there's something weird with this? We finally mix the song. It's like a day later. And then uh, he gets up, and he's all happy because he got the song done. And then he goes, that was great, you know, good. And then he goes, this console's nice. It's kind of dull, isn't it? <laughs> and then he goes upstairs, and he's happy. And I finally, oh, so I take out the voltmeter and I finally get to check the power supplies. And as some of you may know, consoles have bipolar power supplies. There's usually a plus or minus 15 or a plus and minus 24, depending on the manufacturer. And one whole power supply was completely down. So it was only swinging half the current that it could normally swing. It had no high end because it couldn't swing the current fast enough to give us high end. So the song ends up sounding like it's kind of underwater. I was able to fix it, but only after the fact. I wasn't able to fix it for this song. But it was so cool because the song's about a dream, which is interesting. How many takes were the drums? Oh, just the one. All right. I mean, that's how he would do. So we played uh, Let's Go Crazy earlier. He, he, he would just play it, and if you made a mistake, you'd stop and you'd just punch in. But, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Frank, uh, who, uh, wherever mm -hmm. you may be. Um, thanks to you, we got this now.
he's playing all the instruments. And when you think, like, who, who does that? Um, with, the old, with the Lynn drum machine, you could set up like a one or two bar loop, very easily a simple loop. And then you could, with the pads, you could just play rolls on the snare or, or toms or hi-hat. And that's what he was doing with that. So we would just you know, set it up and hit record on the tape machine and let it roll. And if we made a mistake, we'd go back and we could punch in. Well, no, we couldn't actually with the drums because no, we weren't locking to it. But on other instruments, after he would finish and lay down the drum machine, I'd hand him the bass and he'd put on the bass part and then he'd do the keys parts. And halfway through, he'd do the vocal and the backing vocals and then we'd finish it up with the remaining overdubs and we were done. That's one of the few tracks where there is an actual fade out. Yeah. Uh, normally it seems like it's a very composed, decisive moment of like, this is the end of the song. Um, how did these processes work in the studio? That's a great question. That Those decisions often were made in sequencing an album. Prince loved sequencing an album. I had spoken earlier about how an album would have the core songs and he would construct the record around those core songs. So when you're sequencing a record... For Prince, anyway, let me back up a little bit. Um, because so many of his tracks were dance tracks, he would want a long version of things. So this, the original track of this, I can't remember for sure, but it's probably really long. It might be eight or nine minutes long. It could even be longer. So when you're sequencing a record and you kind of know where the song is going to go in the sequence, sometimes you're going to want it to fade out so that you can cross-fade it into the next song. Uh, or, or, yeah, sometimes you, you just want a little breather in the sequence. So uh, we often would print a long version that would have breakdowns and things like that, but we would often print a version that had a fade, so if that's what we wanted in the sequence, ultimately when we cut the record together, we'd have a fade-out version. Where in the sequence of that album would the cross sit? The and cross was on side four, as I recall. I believe it was at, I don't remember where it was, but I thought it was near the end of the record. That was, um, Prince had a, had a few different lyric themes. And one of his themes, of course, was uh, salvation and sort of religious topics. But he would never adhere to any particular religion at that time. But he would talk about an afterlife. And The Cross was one of the songs that he did where he played the, the drums. Um, not well, as a matter of fact, because it speeds up terribly. But... He wanted to say something about his belief system. And, um, and that was near the end of the record, perhaps as a bookend to the t opening track, which was Sign of the Times. Would the recording process of that song differ in any way to, let's say, outside of the channel being on the right voltage now? Um, would that differ in any sort of way to the songs we heard of that album before? Like the cross, would that be a different recording situation? Oh yeah, the cross we did uh, at Sunset Sound. Uh, we at the time when I was with him, we either worked at home or we worked on the road. And there are several songs that were recorded in a mobile truck on tour, or we worked at Sunset Sound. And a good chunk of Sign of the Times was done at Sunset. It was the, the studio is still there. It's a fantastic studio. It's my favorite actually in, in the world. And uh, Prince was very much at home there. He loved the sound of the equipment and he loved the atmosphere, he loved being there. Would you be told beforehand, like, okay, today we're going to do a hot club track, or today we're going to go this way, or this is the mood I'm trying to achieve, or would you just be on guard and seeing what was going to happen? Yeah, I had to, it was more the latter, but um, I'd have to be just ready for anything. He'd call me and tell me, sometimes he'd tell me what instruments to set up, you know, we'd want acoustic piano or electric piano or whatever, but oftentimes he would just have me come to the studio and there'd be a note written, and in fact I still have one at home, just a, a note from him that says, set up this, 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 and this, and but by, by a certain point I knew him well enough that I could read what it was he wanted set it up, like if he says acoustic piano long reverb we're going to be doing a ballad and then it would be my choice what reverb to use and what mics to use on the piano he didn't care about those details I could do it however I wanted but he'd say if he was going to be playing um, acoustic drums sometimes he'd come in with a song already written about half the time the other half the time he would write the lyrics after the track took shape but if he came in with lyrics written like he did with Dorothy Parker or with a song that he was going to play acoustic drums on he would take the lyrics and he'd tape them 
we'd either tape them to a tom if he wasn't going to play that tom, or I'd tape them to a mic stand in front of the kit. He would wear headphones, and with no click, reading the lyrics, he would play the entire drum part from top to bottom, with the fills and the breaks and everything, just mentally singing the song in his head. So we'd lay down this acoustic drum track, come into the control room, lay down the bass, and then everything else, and then eventually sing it. So he would have not full arrangements in his head, but he'd have a, basic arrangements in his head as he was making the track. He knew what he wanted it to sound like. I, I, he didn't. He rarely experimented. And if he just experimented, recorded just for the sake of recording, it was usually just a funk thing, something to dance to. A lot of the album that was never officially released, the album called The Black Album, was songs that we just did. Nearly all those songs were songs we did for a party, just to dance to at a party. Because you could, in those days, you could, you could do a recording, and then if we were at Sunset Sound, we'd take it up the street to Grunman Mastering, and Bernie Grunman would press acetates for us. And then you can take those acetates to the club, and you can play them at the club. And, yeah. How did that make you feel when you spent an awful lot of time in doing, because there were, was a series of albums around that time that it never saw the official light of day. And um, knowing that, oh, we just worked so hard on making this album and then it's gone for this or the other reason. It was funny how, how albums worked with him. Um, he was like a farmer that grew a lot of plants. It's, he was always recording, as I said. So songs that he recorded, and this is why there's so much material in the vault, he was always recording. Whether or not it actually became an album depended on sales of the previous album and depended on what he wanted to say for the next album, which is why I wanted to play Around the World in a Day. That was an anchor song. It was a seed that was an important song. So when I heard that song and heard how he was talking and how he was writing, I knew this is This is the approach. This is the world view. Under the Cherry Moon was certainly the anchor song for the parade record. Other songs just came and went. And whether or not they made it on the record, I think, my own personal thesis, has to do with the lyrics. Um, lyrically, was it saying what he wanted it to say? For example, the song Tambourine on Around the World in a Day. Oh my God, there you are, prettiest thing in life I've ever seen. And he's actually talking about masturbation. All, yeah, he's, he's saying, there I go, falling in love with a face in a magazine, all alone by myself, me and I play my tambourine. <laughs> Now, the groove underneath it is really funky, but he could turn those out in his sleep, practically. So there's other really funky songs, but the lyrics aren't as good. Like songs like um, All Day, All Night, All Day, All Night, You Can Be My Baby, Make You Feel All Right. I mean, and 17 Days, Been Gone, 17 Days, 17 Long Nights. It's, it's okay, it's good, but it's not nearly as clever. So songs were kind of always evolving, and these plants that he grew, sometimes he was growing things specifically for Sheila, or for the time, or for his alter ego. Other times, like with Nothing Compares to You, it was for the family. At one point, he took it back after Sinead O'Connor did it and had that hit with it. So I, I can't, to answer your question, I can't say I was really disappointed. Records were always coming together and then coming apart, depending on uh, whether or not he changed his mind about what he wanted to say. Obviously, a lot of thought has went into making these decisions of whether something should be available to the public or not. And obviously now there's a lot of interest groups that would be like, oh, let's just raid the vaults and then make it all available and we can subsidize the recording industry for the next three years. Mm. Um, to which degree you think even most diehard fans should respect the artist's decision not to release something? That's such a good question. And I don't have a fully thought out answer. I still haven't completely decided what my position is on that because it's so difficult. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So an artist decides, I want you to hear this, this, and this. I said earlier that you know Prince music was just a fraction of the music of his life. He was making a conscious decision at the time when he wrote Nothing Compares to You. He's not going to talk about himself in that way. 
He doesn't want people to know that that's him. So he gives it to his competition. He wants to write it, but he doesn't want to be associated with saying it. He made these decisions about what he wanted us to know about him. He was the most honest of writers. If you want to know who Prince is, listen to his music, because that's how he talked. That's how, that was his way of being in the world. Everything he said in his lyrics, that's who he is. There was no hidden side to him other than uh, what happened later in life when he was in tremendous pain, and that's a topic for another time and for another person. I'm, I, don't, I didn't know him later in life. But anyway, um, how I feel about his unreleased material, my hunch, knowing him, my hunch is that now that he's gone, he'd want us to know everything. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? Why would you want to keep things secret? We already know you, Prince. We know you. The cat's out of the bag. We know who you are. There's nothing that would make us think less of you. I would think that he would want it all out there, but maybe he wouldn't. And that's artistic license, isn't it? I mean, don't artists, you get to decide what you want people to see. Um, Tommy Jordan from Gegita, we, a band I worked with who was influential on me, Tommy used to say, this is good, when the spotlight of attention comes on an artist, you don't want the spotlight coming on you when you're getting dressed and you're just putting on your underwear. That's very unattractive. <laughs> you don't want to be with the spotlight of attention just standing there with one leg in your underwear and the other leg just, oh, no, I'm not ready yet. You want the spotlight to come on you when you're dressed. You want to go outside when you feel you're presentable. And uh, the material that was unreleased, he, he, he was his way of saying no. There's a song called Moonbeam Levels that I heard in 83 when I came, came to work for him. It was one of my favorites. And he wasn't ready to release it. He didn't. He, we put it on Purple Rain on the album sequence at one point, and then he pulled it off. We put it on Around the World in a Day, and he pulled it off. And I was so disappointed every time. He just didn't want people to know that about him. But now I think maybe he would. So what, what do you think about it? I guess there is this moment. I mean, obviously, there's a certain voyeuristic quality when you listen to, let's say, the tapes of Pet Sounds. And all of a sudden, it's, it's almost like um, listening to archaeology. And you all of a sudden start to um, treasure that genius even more because you hear a lot of things that are somehow lost in a Beach Boys classic because you, you, there's too much information going on. And through the dissecting process of listening to all the different versions, you're like, oh, that's in there as well, and that, and ooh, wow. And all of a sudden, when you then go back to the actual thing, um, you're like, oh, wow, I appreciate this a lot more now. At the same time, though, and that would lead to my natural next question, is your job as an engineer or as a producer later is sort of to help the artists formulate and define their artistic statement. And um, I very much like that about recorded music, that how many, no matter how many chefs they were in the kitchen, at one stage, someone had to go like, that is what we put out there. This is the definitive moment. And Watertown sounds the way Watertown sounds, period. And um, so in that way, maybe it's kind of good. I mean, it's like, um, does anyone really care about whatever the notorious B.I.G. was putting into a rhyme after he left us, after that final album? So maybe people should stop their hunger and don't, I don't know, urge for consuming any, anything and everything. And it, it isn't, it, doesn't it depend on why you want it? So uh, talking about different audiences, the fans, the Prince fans want it because, like you said, they want more. They want to know this person that they, they, they'd like to hear more of. I'd like to hear more Beach Boys stuff because I idolize Brian Wilson. I, I love Brian Wilson. I want to hear more. And, and all my musical heroes, yeah, I'll take more, please. Yes, please. But there's another audience, which is the critics and the scholars, and that includes the historians and the music educators. And they want to know where to put this artist in the arc of music's history. How was he important? What kind of person was he? How did he think? What did he do? How important is he? And will we recognize another one like him if another one comes along. So what does it all mean, is what they ask. They should have access to who 
to that. They, these scholars and Why these thinkers. And not the general no, public. what I was going to say is there should, everyone should have access in, so that so that we include the historians and the scholars, so that the scholars can analyze it, so that the fans can love it, and so that other musicians can learn from it. Like maybe you'd, you'd want to learn Prince's bass techniques, or maybe you'd want to learn how do you do a vocal like that? How do you do that? Um, yeah, I, I think there's much to be gained, but it depends on what your perspective is. And, and I think it's, it's rewarding for all, for all of us. It, it doesn't need to reward his label. They've made all the money they're ever going to make on him. And it doesn't need to reward his family because his heirs now don't know what to do with the money that they have. It's, it's for fans. It's for scholars, critics, historians. It's for other musicians. Uh, I, I, it, there's a, there are strong arguments, and I, I'm leaning in favor of releasing it all. But the decision is not up to me. But that's what I've advocated for publicly, to release it all. Let's think about that for a second while we play the song we just talked about and before we move into the next segment. This is uh, The Cross. <laughs> you, men you mentioned uh, recording studios earlier. On. You can hear the effect of Sunset Sound. Some of the earlier songs that were played were recorded either at home or at the, with the warehouse. That's Sunset Sound. That's a custom Domitio console, and you can hear those real echo chambers. The it's actual. So loud. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? Beautiful chambers. Oh, I love that sound. When did you really know you had enough? Oh, hey, <laughs> I was really tired. <laughs> no, um, Paisley Park had finally opened its doors and Prince could finally hire a staff of engineers. It had been just me for previous years, but uh, we had uh, some new folks who could, uh, now we could work in shifts, and he was giving me more independence. He was at home at Paisley Park doing the second Madhouse record, and I was in Los Angeles mixing um, the concert film, The Sign of the Times, the music for that. And, um, and I met a boy. <laughs> I met a guy. And I had a date. One night I had a date. And, uh, Finally, after four Yeah, years. after all these years. I, Friends. There was a, one evening after all these years where I, had, I was out and he was trying to reach me and couldn't find me. I didn't think he was in town. He was in Minneapolis. I was supposed to have the night off. But he flew into L.A. and he was trying to find me and I was unavailable. So the next day... I met him on the soundstage, and uh, as soon as I walked in in the morning, he was already there, which was a bad sign. And then he pulled me, you know, made the gesture and pulled me into this small little booth, and we just went toe to toe. And it was, he was asking, where were you last night? And at the beginning of every relationship, like an employer-employee relationship, and at the end, it's kind of exactly the same. At the beginning, you look at each other and you recognize, okay, you're going to play this role, boss. I'm going to play this role, employee in my case, and this is a voluntary contract. I can quit at any time and you can fire me at any time. But for the moment, in this role together, you be you, I'll be me. For this much money, I'll do this much work, deal, bammo. But at any time, one of you can say, I I'm willing to, re I need to renegotiate. And it was that moment where, where I realized and he realized things can't go on the way they have been. And we realized, well, then they can't go on. It was, it was kind of the end of it. It was a natural end of it. And he knew it, and I knew it. And it was sad, but it just had to happen. So it did. So all the baking him cake was gone. Oh, yeah, he had to buy his own cakes now. <laughs> and I only did that a few times. Um, I'd come, he had a sweet tooth, and every once in a while, when we'd be working at home, uh, he'd you know, say, you know what would be really good right now? Hot chocolate. Or chocolate chip cookies, and I'd go, yeah, you know, and I'd I'd make stuff, but that was that was rare. Uh, he did not exploit me or any of his employees. He didn't expect us to do uh, to go. He expected us to work our asses off. Literally, we had no asses. <laughs> he expected us to work inhumanly hard, but he respected the role of employee employer, and he treated us with respect. And uh, he. He obeyed the social contract of what that relationship was. He was never abusive, never. And in this business, there are a lot of abusive people. He sure as hell wasn't one of them. Did you ever bake for other clients later? No, 
I don't think I did. <laughs> I don't remember that I ever did. I, I were, I, when I worked with this band, Gegita, who was the next really big client in my life in terms of my professional growth, at one point we were all kind of living and working together. At least some of us were all living together. And so cooking was a natural part of it. But that just kind of happened a little bit more organically. I'm sort of somehow getting signals from the back, so I know we sort of need to rush through 20 years um, that happened afterwards till we arrive here. Um, but you managed something extremely interesting outside of having a career as engineer, as producer, and in all these different roles for the next years to come. Um, looking at the discography, there's a lot of people that are really good for the reputation and sound like a hell lot of fun, but also people that you would not necessarily know about and that would be probably way below the pay grade you could expect from someone that has been dealing with an artist of that magnitude. How did you navigate which projects to pick and um, which ones to let go? Well, I had a, um, after I left Prince, I had a, I had a manager and um, I had a couple of managers that didn't work out, and then very briefly, and then I, and then I found a good manager, Sandy Robertson from World's End. How do you find a good manager? I he heard about him, or he heard about me. I really don't remember who approached who first, but we met, and and, and we were mutually um, we mutually agreed that he would manage me. And uh, he had a stable at that time of about forty producers, and I was very very pleased to be among them flattered and pleased, frankly, because I hadn't done much as a producer, but he believed in me. And um, managers, producer managers, like all managers, they take 15%. But what Sandy would do is go out and find work for all of his clients. And he would take meetings in New York and LA and in London. And then he would come back to me and say, are you interested in working with this person or that person? And you say yes or no. And I, and he kept me busy. That was from 1988 all the way up until 2000. Um, he kept me in projects. Um, I wanted to, if I had had my ideal career, I would have worked in R&B and soul music. I would have been making Anita Baker records and Tevin Campbell. And I did do that one record with Tevin Campbell and worked with Albie Shore. But for the most part, I was called upon by the alternative indie crowd. And How did that happen? I mean, you might want to argue that some of the, um, let's say, when you did the Violent Farms, you can somehow draw a line between the cross and what they were doing, if you really... Old. <laughs> yeah, it's very different. Um, I don't know why. I don't know. Sometimes people knock on your door and you don't know why they're knocking, but they're just there. <laughs> and uh, part of it was because I was a woman. Uh, I did not take offense at that. i delighted to have the work. Sure, you can hire me because I'm a woman. I'm fine with that. Uh, and sometimes it was because I had worked with Prince. Sometimes it was because uh, I, I, I liked soul music. And it would behoove, and this is good advice for all of you artists, it would behoove you to populate your team with people who have strengths that are different from your own. You don't want to just work with people who are just like you. You want to bring in other people with musical minds that are going to hear something different in the music. And so uh, I, I would shape things in such a way that they maybe sound a little bit more soulful than they otherwise would have. Because I had that ear and I had that desire and I kept wanting to pull music back to the street that I lived on. So that I think that's why. And at some point I just became, I just accepted it. Well, this is what I do, I guess. And I, I liked it. It's not that I didn't like it. Um, I understood the value of that. You don't always get what you want. Did you ever hire someone based on gender? No. You seem to have pretty strong opinions about why you should pick a certain person. It depends what the role is, but um, you know, you're making music with people. So you have to, in the studio, and when we're making music, you know this, you've been immersed in it. When, when people buy music and when we sell it, we're, we're buying and selling 
emotions. We're communicating emotions. It's different from books. Books are, are words, and that's information. And movies are stories. But this is emotions, and emotions run high in the studio. And you need to be with people that have strengths that you don't have, but also people that you can communicate with. There's a musical language. There's an artistic language where that, that we share, I believe, because we're, we're musicians more or less. I'm not one, but kind of a musician. And so you, you, choose, you just choose those flavors. You, cho you choose those people you want. Gender really has nothing to do with it, nor does race or nationality or anything like that. It just has to do with your artistry and how, how, what you, you know, what you, how you filter music, because each one of us is a filter for music. Some of the projects you did were rather successful, and at one stage you got, uh, had collected enough royalty checks that you were, were like, okay, I'm done with this sort of lifestyle, and opted for something different. How long in advance did you mill around with that thought and... Oh, yeah. Um, we get the calling, you know, whether you're going to become a nun or a priest or you're going to become a rock star. <laughs> you get, you just get a calling. It's just something just tells you, I think this is me. I, th I think this is me. And when I was very, very young, I had the calling to make records. And then when I was about 35, a little, little, little voice started saying, scientist. It would be really good to be a scientist. I had never been to college. I had never finished high school. I never had a formal education. I was self-taught. Um, but that little voice was saying, I don't know, I, I was just curious about the natural world and how it worked, and especially the minds of other species, of other animals. I could just stare at an animal, whether it's a lizard or a I don't know, rat, and just wonder, what's it doing? <laughs> I was just curious. And that's what a scientist is, they're just curious. And the voice started getting louder and louder. And then in my 40s, I began realizing, um, hmm, I overheard something. Uh, T-Bone Burnett was being interviewed for a something. And I was working with T-Bone at the time. This was in the late 90s. And the interviewer asked him, so do you listen to college radio? And he said in that southern drawl, he goes, hell no. <laughs> he said, I'm 47 years old. There'd be something wrong with me if I listened to college radio. And I was just a few years younger and I realized, that's true then, because I was starting to feel it. I was in my 40s and I was starting to realize the music that once spoke to me doesn't speak to me now. I'm interested in jazz and I'm interested in other musics that aren't as, I'm not listening to college radio anymore. And that's when the voice started getting really strong and saying, scientist, scientist. And then I had a hit record as a producer with Bare Naked Ladies. And I got a big royalty check back in those days when we actually sold records. You'd get a lot of money. Sorry, you guys, but that's just how it worked back then. Uh, I hate to, uh, you already know, so I'm not breaking the news. But maybe you'll, you'll make money another way. But back then, we made money from selling records. And it was, a big, it was a big check. And with that check, people pay off their mortgage or they build a home studio. And I opted to quit my job. And I, uh, I, I left. I entered college as a freshman. Uh, Not age. I was uh, how old was I? Let me count back. I was 44 when I when I entered college as a freshman. Yeah. How awkward did you feel? I thought I was going to feel really awkward. I thought the teachers wouldn't like me because I was older. I thought the other kids won't like me because I'm old. <laughs> and I thought I wouldn't be able to learn. I was really scared. But it turned out none of that was true. The teachers liked having an older student. The other students, they wanted to hang out with me. Uh, let's have a study group together. I don't, know, I don't know why, but it was all good. It was all good. And, and I did well. And, uh, and, and I, was, I was right. That instinct was right. I went from there. I did four years at the University of Minnesota. And then I went to McGill, just up the street here, and did four right years. Here. Right here. Right yeah. here, yeah. And got my PhD in uh, program in behavioral neuroscience. And uh, then went to Berkeley College of Music. So I teach psychoacoustics, I teach music cognition, and I teach record production. And, because the kids love it, I teach analog tape. <laughs> kids love it. Um, you had quite the illustrious professors over there at McGill. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I started in uh, Dan Levitin's lab. And just the year I joined his lab, he, d he said, you know, I'm writing this book. It's about, you know, the brain on music. And it became a New York Times bestseller. 
And then uh, because he was so busy with his book tour, I studied with uh, Stephen McAdams in psychoacoustics. He's the world's foremost timbre expert, and he's a hardcore scientist. And then there's Evan Balaban and Carolyn Palmer, these great, great, great music cognition researchers. McGill is the world's mecca for music perception and cognition. So it's just really fortuitous. Are you implying that if you have an, an, a chance to extend your visa, you should just sign up over there? It, uh, McGill is pretty great. I mean, it's a really prestigious college. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to have studied there. Unfortunately for me, my, um, my scientific career will be short. I'm not going to make a big contribution to science because I got my degree when I was 52. And um, Berkeley keeps us really busy. I mean, it's a teaching college. So I have my lab and I do um, experiments, <coughs> but um, it's, I, 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 I get to play scientist and I get to do a little bit of stuff, but mostly I'm a teacher now. And seeing that that was that voice that was egging you on to do all that, do you feel sad that it was probably a little too late? Oh, no, no. It's so good, you guys. It's so good. If you... This is my theory. That if you want to figure out how to have a really good life, the first thing you have to do is do what you did when you were five years old. Just daydream. So a five-year-old doesn't have to do much. Doesn't have to go to school really, doesn't have to go to work, doesn't have to pay a mortgage, doesn't have to put food on the table. Really, you have a lot of time to just daydream. So your mind goes a lot of places. And when you're five years old, you get to know yourself as much as you can at age five. We undervalue that. The best thinking I've ever done in my life, and I think the best thinking most people do, is when you just daydream. When you're like a five-year-old in that you're, uh, let's say you've, you've paid your bills, okay, so you're comfortable, that you're not going to get evicted any moment, you, you're okay for a minute, uh, you're not going to starve, you're not going to freeze to death, you're not going to overheat, you're, you're good. If you can resist the temptation to be on input and be taking in the web or the TV or other people's music, if you can resist the input to take in other ideas, just shut the fuck up for just a minute and let your brain have some freaking fun. Let it just go where it wants to go. Just let it daydream. And when it can do that, it will, if you're open to it, it it'll show you who you are, who you are. Your daydreams, that's who you are. And so if you're really fortunate and, and you believe, if you have that daydream and you believe it, and you can get someone to pay you to think like that, then you're in good shape. So when I was young, I daydreamed about being where records were made. I didn't see myself. I didn't have the dream of being an artist or being a performer. I mean, all little kids get on a microphone or on a hairbrush in front of the mirror, and they're like, oh, they're singing. But you know, I knew that wasn't me. I knew that me, my daydream was just to help records get made. And then later that dream became, wouldn't it be fun to just look at stuff? Wouldn't it be fun to just watch stuff? And that's what scientists do, they measure things. They watch it and they measure it. And so that's what I do now. And when I'm in my laboratory, I do auditory brainstem response measurements. So the musicians, Berkeley musicians come in and I stick the electrode right here and then the two more electrodes here on the mastoid bone right behind the ears. And I put earbuds in their ears and I play them the most boring of all sounds. It's just a stream of clicks. But I can measure the activity in the auditory nerve bundle going from the cochlea up to the, up to the temporal lobe. And what that activity tells us is whether or not these young musicians are at risk for early onset hearing damage. Are they, are they hurting themselves with their practice? And what I want to know is, my specific question is, are some instruments more dangerous than others? Drummers, are you at greatest risk for future hearing loss? Is it our electric guitar players? Is it the kids in the heavy metal bands? Is it the horn players? Is it the vocalist? A voice can be really loud, and if it's right there next to your ear, that can be really dangerous. Is it DJs? Who's at risk? And so that's what I do when I'm in the lab. I just watch the signals, and I look at stuff, and I measure it. And it feels really good. That's, that's a, a good way to be, I think. 
On that feel good note, I would love to open it up to questions because I guess, especially with the last hints, um, you gave people a lot of incentive to ask stuff, but I don't want to do that without taking the chance to um, maybe ask everyone to join me in thanking Dr. Suzanne Rogers for taking the time today. Thank you very, very much, Torsten, for your questions. They were great. I really appreciate your generosity in letting me speak for this long. Um, thank you for your attention. I, I, I love musicians. I love music. Um, I, want you to, I want you to be great, and I want you to do great things. And I want you to realize, this is something our, our visiting artist, Greg Wells, just said when he came to visit Berkeley. He's a famous record producer. And he looked at our Berkeley kids, and he said, I want to tell you something. You don't, you don't realize it. You don't know how great great is. And I thought, oh, good. Great is really good. <laughs> really good. When you get to work with a K.D. Lang, or you get to work with a Prince, or you get to work with Tricky, or you get to work with any artist you care to name who's selling a lot of records, believe me, when you see these people in person and you're in the studio, Megan Trainer, some of our Berkeley grads actually produced some songs on her first record, and they described Megan Trainer and they played some tracks for us. Megan Trainer, I know I'm all about that bass, is great. Good is really good. So you're going to have to work really, really hard. You're already good because you're here. You have to have been. Somebody recognized something in you. Somebody liked what you do, and they like how you talked, and they like the cut of your jib. So you're doing all right. But you got a lot of work to do because grade is really high. So I, I, I hope you do it. I'm looking forward to hearing what you do. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for all the stories. And I'd want to ask a lot of questions about the Prince era, but I'm going to go back to where you are now. I'm curious about, uh, like, when we cut ourselves, or if we get cut, our flesh heals. Do you know about the ear's ability to heal, it, heal itself after it's been damaged? The I don't know how much you know about it, but I can, I'll try and be brief. Inside the cochlea, which is that little bony shell that's shaped like a snail, um, there's a membrane, the basilar membrane, and above the basilar membrane are hair cells. There's a single row of inner hair cells, and then there's a triple row of outer hair cells. Hair cells, if you look them up online, you see they're one of the coolest things in all the universe. It, it just, it, it looks like a cartoon drawing of an alien. So it's a cell, and it's got these little hairs on top, and it's got a nucleus in it. So when you're hearing a sound, sound is coming into your ear canal, and it's pushing your eardrum back and forth, and that's connected to three little bones, which is pushing a little oval window, which is a little port on that bony cochlea. It's pushing that back and forth. That's connected to this membrane. It's going up and down like this. On top of that are the little hair cells, and they're swinging back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as they swing back and forth, and this is, this is why nature is fucking amazing. So it, it, it's impossibly small, but like the little hairs themselves have pores in them. And as the hairs swing back and forth, and they're connected by this little spring at the top, all these little springs. So the hairs on springs are swinging back and forth. Pores in the hairs are opening and closing, and ions are coming in and out. That becomes, that's your analog to digital converter. That's your analog signal, the hair cells going back and forth, which converts the signal, if it's hot enough, into a nerve spike. There's a nerve sitting there waiting at the bottom of that hair cell saying, hit me. And if it gets enough, uh, enough ions coming in, it becomes a nerve spike. And there's your one if the signal is there, and a zero if it isn't. So there goes the nerve spike, and it goes up the chain, and it goes to here. So to answer your question, think about it. You've got a hair cell, and you're playing at a pure tone of 4K, 4,000 hertz. The little hairs are going back and forth 4,000 times a second. And that becomes spikes. If you overdo it and you blast those hair cells for too long, too much, what happens is the nerve that's sitting there waiting, 
to receive all those neurotransmitters, those ions, the charged ions, which became neurotransmitters. The nerves get so overexcited, they suffer from excitotoxicity, and the ends of the nerves swell and they burst. So hair cells can die from overuse, and they do not grow back. An auditory nerve is a long nerve, long, it's long in biological terms, it's about, a, about 25 millimeters, an inch or so long, from the inner ear to the cortex to right here. But that path, that's our wiring, and that consists of about 35,000 nerves on each side. The nerves have branches. Musical training in childhood grows more branches. So that's good news and bad news for musicians. Musicians, this is well established, and I'm glad I have an opportunity to say this to you. Musicians who've been training since childhood have a super highway for processing sound compared to non-musicians. You guys hear things in sound that I don't catch. It's not that your hearing is necessarily better than mine. It's that because you're musicians, your processing acuity is sharper and finer than mine. It's like you've got a really sharp photograph, I've got a Polaroid. I can still see it's a Polaroid picture, it's dad and it's the boat and it's in the driveway. Yeah, yeah, I can see what it is. I can tell you what it is. You guys with your high resolution system can tell us, hey, in this picture, dad's fly is down. <laughs> I can't see that detail. I can't hear that detail. So to answer your question a little bit more thoroughly, one, the hair cells can die and they don't come back. Two, branches on the auditory nerve can die and eventually kill off the nerve. We're gonna kill off some of it anyway as we age, just as our eyes are gonna change. But think of sound exposure like a sunburn. If you do it too many times, if you burn your skin too much for too long, your skin says, okay, I guess this is what we're doing, and tumors can grow. And likewise, if you burst your hearing too much over too long of a time, the auditory system says, I can't deal with it anymore, it's just too much. Um, you musicians are somewhat protected because you have a better pathway, but um, you're still at risk, and once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, research is being done right now at a ferocious pace to help see if we can grow new auditory nerves and new hair cells, but so far, no, not, not too much. But the good news is, and I wanna leave you with bad news, this is, and this is super cool and it's recent. Scientists have discovered that not all injury is created equal. So let's take an, a crude example. If you are playing a sport you love, your favorite sport, after you've played that sport for a whole day, your muscles are gonna ache, or you feel kinda good. Because, yeah, your body hurts, but you felt good doing it. So that muscle ache is different than the muscle ache you would get if someone pushed you down a flight of stairs. So literally, when we add insult to injury, it hurts worse and it causes more damage. Likewise, noise exposure caused by sound we do not like, like construction work or gunshots and stuff like that, is much more damaging than the same sound pressure level from sound that we like. So when we're being a DJ, when we're mixing, when we're working in the studio, when we're playing, we're actually not getting the same level of harm as when we're just exposed to random noise. So there's some protection there. Uh, that said, it, the early results of my work is suggesting that maybe horn players might be at greatest risk for hearing damage. And that surprised me. I thought it would be drummers. I thought it would be the electric guitar players. But with a drummer, your cymbal is at some distance from your ears. Your snare is at some distance. Um, with electric guitar players, your amp is going to be at some distance. Rather the guy who's sitting next, who's right. sitting next to the exactly. cymbal. Exactly. Yeah. The person setting up your amp is probably in greater danger. Um, yeah, but horn players will often have, in a set, they'll have the bell of some guy's horn right next to their ear, and that can be that can be rough. On the notion of psychoacoustics, how does it work if someone like Beethoven, um, who had hearing loss, was still able to compose? Mm. That involves something called auditory imagery. Musicians are known to be better than non-musicians at auditory imagery. And it stands to reason then that genius, genius musicians would be extraordinarily great at it. It's the capacity to, um, one, imagine a song in your head, you know, have an earworm, but two, to be able to control and remember the sound that's in your head. It takes a, a high working memory capacity to be able to think of a theme like Beethoven would have to do, 
play it in his head and then add orchestration, add harmony to that. A genius musical mind could do it because his brain was so adept at manipulating auditory signals. Mere mortals would have a hard time, but Ravel did it, and after a number of years, we could. Um, that has been shown uh, in, in laboratories. It has been shown that musicians can hold and manipulate a signal in auditory memory longer than a non-musician can. Uh, so, I, actually, you almost answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, first of all, thanks so much for the really insightful interview. Uh, and the question is, if um, I mean, it's kind of segues into something I've been thinking recently, that great artists and musicians are, when you listen to their music, you are really listening to how they hear, and the decisions they make are, are really informed mm. by that. And uh, I, I keep sort of realizing this more and more. Uh, so the question is, I guess, if there are moments when uh, Prince or someone else that you've worked with, some of these, these great creators have sort of done things or m reacted in ways which were so unnatural to you or which were so surprising that it could have only happened if one's perception and system of perception and hearing was so different and, uh, you know, maybe idiosyncratic or unexpected or... You know, any moments like that which may have remained in your memory where... Um, yes, mm. um, the band I worked with um, not long after Prince, this band Gegita, you would have heard of Geggy. Geggy is uh, Greg Kirsten. He just wrote and produced Adele's new album. And um, prior to that, he's been nominated a couple of times for the Grammy Award for Producer of the Year in 2015 and in 2009. He works with Pink, Pink and Sia, and he's one half of the bird and the bee. So anyway, he's the gag in Geggy Ta, and then Ta is Tommy Jordan. And... Um, the first time I heard their music, it was a little cassette in the offices of uh, Warner Brothers Records, and I realized, these guys know something about music that I don't know, and I'm desperate to know it. It was just something, it was something about this song and the arrangement of it that made me think, I don't know what that is, but I know they're hearing something that I can't hear, and I want to know what it is. So we, you'd mentioned earlier about you know what records to say yes to and what records to reject. I, I, I said yes to this record, and it was supposed to last only two weeks because they only had two weeks' worth of money. I ended up working on this record for a year, and I nearly went bankrupt. I, I was this close to declaring bankruptcy. But what I learned about music from those guys actually allowed me to have success in all the records I did afterward because I learned so much about music. So that's a very um, astute point. When we listen to music, we're listening to the outcome of decisions. You're hearing everything that the artist wanted you to hear, but you're not hearing the rest of the decision process. You're not hearing what they rejected. You're not hearing the outtakes. You're not hearing all the different keyboard presets they went through, all the different guitar presets or grooves they went through until they arrived at that. Being a record producer involves that process. That's what you walk into the room with is a decision criterion for what constitutes right and what constitutes wrong. And you don't know if you're right or wrong. You don't know. But you listen to a performance and you just say no, 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 until you say yes. And, and then there it is. Uh, the, what the listener gets is the execution, but you never know the distance between the, the execution and the intention. You never know what they tried to do. You only know what they did. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, uh, the band I'm thinking of is, is Gegita, but uh, yeah, G-E-G-G-Y, and then the second word is Ta, T-A-H. They had three albums out on David Byrne's Luakabop label. Um, I learned more about music from those guys um, than anybody, but the song that I heard in Kevin Lafferty's office was something called Ready for Rain, and they never did release it. It was like Prince's Moonbeam Levels. Tommy never released it, but it was, they were geniuses. They were both geniuses in a, in a very different way, different kind of musical genius. Um, over here. I just wanted to ask something because you were just talking about decisions. And um, while you were talking about the processes of uh, the recordings of Prince, for instance, where you have all these boss pedals and it was recorded that way and it was irreversible, um, nowadays, all, and I, and, and I see it here in the studios and the programs, 
um, especially as everything is very much computer driven in production, you are offered a variety of possibilities of the possibility of again removing effects, yes. adding, changing, whatever. So your these decisions that you had to take that had some kind of responsibility because they were irreversible, I think somehow probably helped in the in the process uh, rather than right. endangered it. But then on the other hand, all these possibilities that are given are something that actually is making much more difficult to take decisions. And decisions is what takes you to a record. How do you would say or how you would share to people who are producing oh, with good. all these vast right. possibilities that maybe are not a help or sometimes are to how to confront this um, in some way to 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 creatively get out of this. Yeah. You, I'm so glad Lovely. for your question because now I can teach you something that Gegita taught me. Um, in the old days of record making, we made records from the materials to the vision. So you'd take the materials that you have and then you'd make a record with those materials. And in the case of, let's say, um, Motown, what are the materials? We've got these players, we've got Holland, Dozier, Holland, we've got these songwriters, we've got Smokey Robinson, we have these materials, we've got these little studios. What can we make with this? And you're constrained, your decisions, of course, are constrained because you're either going to go 8-track or you'll go 16-track or you're going to go 24-track. When I worked with Prince, it was 24-track, and he would not. He refused to synchronize two machines together. So the entire arrangement had to be be realized in 24 tracks. But we went from the materials, here's the instruments we have, to the vision, here's what we can make. Most records are done that way. The only people who could have a visionary record, here's what I'm envisioning, and then now I'm gonna go out and get the materials to make that, would be the people with endless amounts of money. The Beatles could make a visionary record. They could make Sgt. Pepper. Paul Simon could make a visionary record. People who had all the money in the world. But most people went from the materials to the vision. Now, because the tools are so affordable, everyone can go from the vision to the materials. You can make anything you can think of. And your software sense and your tools will allow you to have, you could have an echo, echo chamber. If you've got a laptop, you've got a studio. You can have an echo chamber, you can have a choir, you can have an orchestra, you can have a gamelan orchestra. You, you can go from the vision to the materials. Now when you go from the, when everyone is going from the vision to the materials, that says what, as Prince used to say. The one who wins is gonna be the one with the best vision. Back in the old days, the big records were the ones who had the best materials. The high budget records, just like high budget movies, they had the best materials. They can hire Barbara, Streif Barbara Streisand or the LA Philharmonic. Now, it's whoever has the best ideas because everyone has the same materials. Uh, it, it, I would say to your generation, um, if you want to improve your thinking, give yourself constraints. Give yourself a time constraint, a money constraint, an instrumentation constraint, a track constraint, and force your thinking, constrain your thinking to to, to allow it to grow, to allow it to flourish. Don't let it run wild. Give it some boundaries. <laughs> Give it some parameters and, and see what you can make with that. It's a great exercise for your thinking, which is what's gonna, what you're going to build your career on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it.